Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elisa Slazinska, and I work for the City of Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Welcome to the BACP Business Education Workshop Webinar Series. We have adapted our regular business education workshops at City Hall into these webinars until further notice. On behalf of our commissioner, Rosa Scarino, I want to inform you that business licenses can be processed online where applicable by visiting chicagobusinessdirect.org. And as I go through the information, please note, I will put all websites and email addresses in the chat box for you to reference. If you are part of the Business Start Certificate Program, you will get credit for joining this webinar by sending an email to BACP Outreach at cityofchicago.org. If you want to learn more about the program, please visit chicago.gov backslash business workshops. Visit our resource page for City of Chicago business, consumer, and employees impacted by COVID-19 at chicago.gov backslash BCP COVID-19. And as Chicago has entered phase three, cautiously reopening as of today, the City of Chicago Business Affairs and Consumer Protection has been hosting webinars for specific industries to follow safety guidelines during the reopening process. To visit more information about reopening, please go to chicago.gov backslash reopening for industry-specific guidelines. We still have a couple more webinars for reopening that are happening. To see the webinars, please visit chicago.gov backslash business workshops. And today's webinar will be hosted by Donna Rockin of Rockin Enterprises. The webinar will be about marketing basics, what you need to know. Donna? Very kind of you. I hope everyone can hear me. And um, I do live downtown, not far from Northwestern Memorial Hospital. So if you hear an ambulance in the background, I apologize in advance. My windows are shut, but sometimes it's a busy day. Um, we're going to talk about marketing. I do have a lot of expertise. I've been helping clients with their marketing needs for over 40 years. You can't see, if you look me up on LinkedIn, you'll see how hair, how gray my hair is. You'll know why it's over 40 years I've been helping people. So we're going to talk about marketing. Oh, I have to, I, she told me I have to uh, go down this way. And we're going to talk about building a marketing plan. And the first thing you have to do is identify your niche or positioning strategy. And sometimes your strategy when you're a small business is just that you are the only one in the neighborhood. And that can really be a unique selling proposition because people don't have to go to great distances to get the good or service that you're selling. They, whether you're a pet groomer or you have a little cafe, you know, the fact that you're just down the street in the neighborhood. Also, you have to create an appealing image or package and sometimes the image is yourself if you're a real estate agent. If you ever you know, bought a house or used a real estate agent uh, for your business, you know that they dress to the nines, they're always impeccably you know, groomed, and they try to drive a luxurious car, so you know they will find you your dream home or business location. And that, but sometimes it's a real package for, you know, it has to protect the product and shipping, but it also has to make it very easy to understand if you're sold at a retail location because each package is like a billboard and you only have a couple of seconds to make an impact on your end consumer to buy you. We're also going to talk about developing a promotional plan and we're going to talk about pricing your products or services. And when we talk about product, it can be interchanged in this um, seminar, whether it's a product or a service. It just depends on whether you're in the service industry or the product industry. And then also about selling your products and where to sell them. So we'll cover all those things. Now, customers, what's important to know is customers buy 
um, product benefits. You may think of it as a feature, but it is a product or a service benefit. And when you define a product features, you know, it's important that you really think in terms of what's in it for the customer. So if we practice and we look at this little raincoat picture, um, you notice that it has pockets. And can any of you, I, I see that we have a chat box, can any of you tell me why these are product benefits, the pockets, the collar, the fact that it's machine wash and dryable, that it's a mid-length, that it's got a matching hat? The pockets are important because they hold stuff. And if you have a phone and keys and a wallet and you want to run out to the store and not drag a purse, you know, those, those, those deep pockets, my husband complains and Levi's has probably listened to him because they are going back to deeper pockets for men. Um, and the collar keeps the rain out of your neck. And the machine wash and dry, it's easy to take care of. I will pay more for something that is wash and dry than something that is dry cleaning because it's more convenient for me to just throw it in the machine and wash it and dry it. The mid-length is good for most situations. And the matching hat means that I can cover my head if I don't want to take, or a hood if is important too, a detachable hood if I don't want to carry an umbrella. So important to understand that you're talking about product benefits. These are the four cornerstones of marketing. I didn't make them up. Philip Cutler is a famous American marketer, and um, he might be a professor emeritus now at Northwestern University, but he was originally at Northwestern University when he developed the four Ps. And it's the first P is for product. The second is for the price of the product, meaning product or service. The third is the promotion, how to let people know about your product or service. And also the last P is placement or distribution. How do you get the product to your end user? And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's very, and most of you have probably noticed if you've been in stores, so many goods have been off the shelves. You can't find them. I'm telling you, there's a run on frozen vegetables. All this time of the shelter-in-place order, I have barely been able to find the frozen vegetables I want. Many weeks I don't find them, and I used canned or something, or fresh. But placement is important. Is your good or service where people expect to buy them? So when we talk about the product or service description, product is our first P. It's important that we define each product or service the business offers. Determine what common problem or problems you are solving. And that means define your unique selling proposition. What makes you so special? And like I said, sometimes it's just that you have the first cafe in the neighborhood, or you're the only dry cleaner in the neighborhood, or the only pet groomer in the neighborhood. The unique selling prop proposition is the factor or consideration presented by a seller as the reason that one product or service is different and better than that of the competition. And so sometimes it's that it's different because you're available. You're right there. How, much, how many of us have paid more for hand sanitizers these last several weeks because we could find it? If the store had it, we didn't quibble that it was twice the price that it used to be before the pandemic. We were so happy that we found it. We were just happy it wasn't three or four times the price. Now, also when you define uh, the product or service description and define them in detail, think about each product, you know, each color of the product is a different product. Each flavor of the product, if you make, you know, seasonings or, and um, I think his name is Colonel Popcorn. That's a Chicago-based business. It's uh, popcorn flavorings, but each flavor, whether it's cheddar cheese or uh, nacho or garlic, each flavor is a different product. Each size the store carries is a different product. Um, all of the product service 
attributes you have to define in detail when you're doing your marketing plan. And then also, does the business offer slightly different product variations for different users? You can think of um, General Motors, where they have the Chevy, and then they have a Buick, and then they have a Cadillac. So you can think in terms of car dealers. But you can also think that some product manufacturers make one size for the consumer, the retail consumer, the ones, the things you buy at Jewel or Mariano's, and they make a different industrial size, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, for the commercial user. You know, you might want a five pound bag of flour, but a bakery might be buying a 50 pound or a 100 pound bag of flour. Um, does the business offer, so a commercial user might have a different product than a retail user. Does the business offer an assortment of product prices to meet customer needs? And that's again where you can think of a Chevy or a car dealer that there's, you know, the Chevy is one price point, the old is a little more luxurious and a little more expensive. And then the Cadillac is very luxurious, but very expensive. So do you have a product uh, or service for every need? And sometimes that's the basic strip down you know, where you wash and fold the clothes, maybe in a laundromat as a service, and then the others where they iron them, where they, you know, put starch in the collars for men's shirts, and uh, define the product uh, or service packaging or the image. Are you going for, and these did not go over big, at, um, and I'm older than most of you, but at one point they tried to move generic food where it was just called corn or peas or pasta, and they were such stripped down packaging that looked like it was from an army surplus, they did not go over big because they were so stripped down, people were afraid to buy them. It's like, am I buying one notch above dog food? So even stripped down packaging, when you buy a store brand, still has to look like it's getting something of, of nutritive value and as well as monetary value. So then um, you have to define the pricing and the price structure for each product or service you offer. Does one price fit all? And that might be a case. You know, if you only make a product and you start selling it only online or, you know, in late night television, where you say as seen on TV, because some of those products, the pet egg, that was first advertised only on TV. And then it worked its way into uh, big mass merchandisers like Walmart and uh, Target and uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. And it's the same price. No matter where you buy the pet egg, it's pretty much the same price. And um, then there's are there various prices offered on different product attributes. That's when we talked about the Chevy or the Olds or the Cadillac. You know, the more luxurious, the more money you pay. And sometimes individually, some of you might buy little cups of applesauce for your kids because some kids like it and the other kids don't, and you don't want to open up a big jar because you won't use it fast enough. But you are paying additional money for those little individual cups of applesauce. Are volume discounts available? If you buy, and you'll see it a lot of times, in um, drug chains and grocery chains that, um, you know, you'll buy three 12 packs of soda for a lesser amount than if you buy one at a time. And so they're giving you a volume discount because they're buying at a cheaper price because they, they know they're going to go off the shelf. They're going to have more sales if it's three for 12 or three for 10 instead of charging $6 a piece for a 12-pack of Coca-Cola. How is the product or service positioned? Now, this is when you talk about, is it a loss leader? Is the Jewel Foods giving away um, eggs for 99 cents at 29 cents at Easter time? Because they want you to come to Jewel. They don't want you to go to Mariano's. They don't want you to go to Aldi's. They don't want you to go to Pete's. That they or Farm Fresh, whatever the grocery store is in your neighborhood, they want you to make a special trip and go to a Jewel Foods because they're giving away eggs at 29 cents. Or sometimes, sometimes even at Thanksgiving time, like a turkey is pennies 
a pound with a $25 offer, with a $50 additional spend at the grocery store? Are you on par with the competition? And this is where you look at candy bars, whether they're um, made by Nestle's or by Hershey, pretty much the same size candy bar is the same size price, regardless of which brand of, of candy bar you're buying. Are they slightly more expensive? Dove candy, which is owned by Mars, but Dove is slightly more expensive than on a unit basis that may be um, M&M, uh, you know, little hot bags are at Halloween. You know, you're paying more for the Dove brand name. It's more luxurious, they're individually wrapped, so it's slightly more expensive than the competition. Or do you wanna be the most expensive? And that's where you put in the Cadillac, the Lexus, the BMW, you know, does it say something even if you're priced just for the amount that the, that the customer will pay for it and not because it costs that much more to make it. I worked for a television manufacturer and it was less money to make a 20, 25 inch TV than a 13 inch TV because we didn't sell that many 13 inch TVs. But sometimes because you want a small TV in a tight kitchen or a small space in a den or a study, you know, you are willing to pay more for it, but it's really more money because they just didn't make that many of them. Promotion, how will you promote the business and its products and services? There, I'm sure you've all heard of advertising and advertising is, you know, big mass media. Now, some media you can buy locally. When you buy mass media, we talk about radio or satellite radio. But some radio stations are very specific where if you had, if you made cowboy boots, you might only want to buy on uh, country western stations or a satellite radio country western station. And then there's television and cable television. And if I was on a, a TV show, that was geared for children, whether it's educational cartoons or if Mr. Rogers is still on in reruns, you know, and it was a child's product, that might be a good place to advertise. And you can buy, you know, specific parts of America. That's why I don't know how many of you noticed this, but Hellman's mayonnaise is here in the Midwest and might be on the East but out west, it's best mayonnaise. It is the same product in a very similar package. And it's because one bought the other one out, and I don't know who bought whom out, but it is the same exact mayonnaise. But it, it had such an entrenchment in the brand name that they just kept the two different names, even though it's an identical product. Um, print magazines, you can buy a run of the magazine. So say you make a product that's only good uh, for, for parts of America that have snow. You can actually buy a distribution that's just in the snow belt versus, um, and I once learned this, they actually make air conditioners different in uh, south of the Mason-Dixie line because the north traditionally doesn't have that many days of 100 plus, although God alone knows Chicago has had its fair share. But, um, but in the South, they have so many days over 100 that they actually make train air conditioners to different specifications if they're sold in the South versus the North. And it's the same thing with like snow shovels or salt that melts ice and snow. You don't need it in the South. You do in the North. So you might only want to run by a section of a magazine's national run that runs in zip codes that have snow. Same thing with newspapers. Trade press is very good for business-to-business -business products. So if you sell lubricant, you might want to be in a trade magazine that goes to engineers that run factories. Um, billboards is very important that you can read it in about three or four seconds because that's all you're going to see when you're flying by at 55, 60 miles an hour. So, you know, you can buy them in a region, like if you have a 
local restaurant and you only want to advertise to that neighborhood, you know, one billboard that's well situated might be a very good investment of media buy. And then there's always digital media. But when you in digital media, you know, there's a lot of um, clutter and noise. So it's easy just to click, I don't want to see the message. Like sometimes I see a message and I click like, I don't want to see it. And then I realize, oh, wait, maybe I did want to see it. And usually it'll, you know, come back in another, you'll see it in an hour or so and you'll see it again. But sometimes you're so used to just clicking on that X to shut it that you don't pay attention. Now, in um, when we talk about promotion, there's advertising, which is more brand building and um, having a feeling about buying that brand. That's why they use beautiful women to sell cars, uh, because they think that the men will imagine themselves driving with that beautiful woman in the seat next to him. So, But sales promotion is the difference between advertising and sales promotion. Sales promotion is often much more targeted, and it's geared towards more immediate sales. So you want to keep the product or service top of mind. And that's why in Chicagoland, Walgreens, and Walgreens now is in many parts of America, but they put out a flyer every week, what's on sale, to get you in the store. Because when you're in there for the sale item, they know that, yeah, you might buy the Band-Aids. They're not on sale, but you remember you need Band-Aids or you need Neosporin. So they want to get you in that door. And it's the same thing with CVS, and that's why on Wednesday all the food stores come uh, and advertise their products. So, you know, it's to keep it top of mind so that you're looking what's the reason to go in the store because very few of us can ever go into the store just to buy the sales item. A few people can, but nobody I know. Uh, so part of sales promotion are direct mail. That's when you get offers and you get a coupon from Bed Bath & Beyond every other week. Uh, coupons, uh, continuity or loyalty programs, that's when you, uh, to keep business and people coming back, the pizza parlor says we'll give you a punch card and get 10 pizzas and you get the 11th one free or buy 12 and get the 13th one free. That's a continuity or a loyalty program for coming back. And uh, Starbucks does it too. Special sales events, and they're often combined with mass media, but that's sometimes I'm even curious. They were still having a Memorial Day sale for um, one of the big furniture chains. Now I can't remember, only because I'm not in the market for furniture right now. But, you know, that's a special sales event where they might take an ad out in the Tribune or do uh, billboards or radio spots in addition to sending special sales flyers or doing special ads just for the sale. Trinkets and trash are also known as tchotchkes or leave behinds. And that's something that reminds you how to buy that product or service again. Um, think of the magnet that goes on your wash machine when the wash repair guy comes to repair it or the same thing with your furnace or your hot water heater. He wants to make it, in, or she wants to make it incredibly easy for you to find their name and number again so that if another appliance breaks in the house or you need them to come back you know, two years later to fix the same appliance, you can make it incredibly easy. Or if you need to recommend him to a neighbor or a sister or a sister-in-law or a brother or brother-in-law, you know, oh, yeah, we had our washing machine fixed. You know, Joe, the repair guy, did a wonderful job. I can get his number. It's right on a magnet on the washing machine. So that's trinkets and trash. And then also social media or electronic media, and especially when clients or target audience is very young. We're going to talk more about target audience in a few minutes. But that is a great way to reach your target audience. And I will tell you, Lumal Nadis, which is a local, you know, wonderful pizzeria. I'm sure all of you have heard of Lou Malnati's and there's probably one in your neighborhood. They do so well by developing a family feeling about their stores and their products and their wonderful service 
that they actually only advertise job openings via their social media because they feel if you follow them, then you understand their values and what they stand for and that you love their pizza already so that you're going to be an employee that's a notch above if you um, shop with them. So uh, where will the products be sold? Will you use wholesalers or two-step distribution? That's when you sell to a wholesaler and then they sell to the end users. And um, most grocery stores buy from wholesalers because they don't want to take necessarily a crate of tomato sauce. They want a case of 12. So that's a two-step distribution. They sell to the wholesalers, the wholesalers sell to the retailers, and the retailers sell to the end consumer. But a lot of businesses sell directly to retailers now. Think um, home appliances, they sell to the big appliance shops, the, the um, um, God, I'm trying to think of the blue one, you know, or uh, after, you know, the department stores. And then will the businesses sell over the internet? Best Buy is who I was thinking of. A lot of big retailers sell directly to Best Buy. And then um, businesses, do they sell over the internet? Some businesses sell over the internet, but some only have websites that tell you where to buy it at a store near you. And will the business sell using catalogs? And you might be shaking your head. What is this lady talking about a catalog? But if you ever bought from Land's End, when you buy from Land's End, they ship you the product and they ship you a catalog. And so if you bought ladies' clothes, maybe they'll ship you a catalog of things for the house or things for the men and the, and the children in your life. But they, they still believe in catalogs, and that's a very successful company. As does even Bed Bath & Beyond. Their catalogs are smaller, but a lot of times they send you those six, you know, if we're there, four, eight-page brochures when it's seasonal, back to school in time for the holidays. Where can you buy a Coca-Cola? So think a minute and think where you can buy a Coke. Just think in your mind all the places you can buy one. I don't think you're ever more than 300 yards away from a Coca-Cola. You can buy one in a drug chain, in a grocery chain. In the grocery chain, you can get them in the pop aisles. But you can buy when they have those kiosks at the checkout. They also have them when you first enter the store. You can buy them at mass merchandisers. A lot of times they have a soda machine right when you walk in the door. And warehouse clubs. I know that you can buy a soda can uh, right when you walk into Home Depot. So warehouse clubs, convenience stores, gas stations, laundromats, office lounges. Um, hospital lounges, student lounges, highway rest stops, newsstands in large office buildings. I worked in a large downtown office, and the man who sold you gum and candy also had soda pop, also gave you, sold you your lotto tickets. So I don't think you're ever too far away from a can of Coke or Pepsi. More on distribution channels. Will the business sell merchandise on the internet? Or like I said, will you only have a website that describes the products and where to find it? Or direct sales? Will you sell through mail order uh, catalogs? Or will catalogs just be for special events? Macy's mostly wants you to go online, but when the stores were open, not during the pandemic, but they would send you Specialty catalogs for special sales events, 4th of July, Memorial Day, Thanksgiving, et cetera. And consider different channels to reach different target audiences because the catalog is still a nice way to get some person to look at your merchandise while they're having a cup of coffee and taking a break. Target audience is a, is, we're going to talk about market segmentation, and a target audience is a specific segment of a market that shares specific customer attributes. And you ask yourself who uses the business or the product, uh, the business service or the product? Is it a homeowner? Is it a woman 18 to 25? You know, is it a child? But if it is a child, you have to ask who buys the product and who uses it because it's not always the same person. So sometimes you have to 
market to two target audience. You have to get Junior to say he wants Cocoa Krispies, but you have to get Mom to believe there's some nutritional value in it that she will put it in the cart and pay for it. When you think about the user isn't the same as the buyer, think baby food, diapers, men's clothing, even nursing homes. Adult children are who decide, usually very often, which nursing home they can afford and which they think is clean and safe for their elderly parents and not the parents because they're not too keen always about going. What attributes do people or businesses share that cause them to have the same product service needs and what common problems do they want solved? That's how you decide on your target audience. What problem are you solving for a big group of people? Now, these are some common attributes to use for market segmentation, age, sex, body type. Think of it in body type. I don't mean it in a mean way, but there are petite sizes now for women and ladies plus sizes or big and tall sizes for men, income level, home ownership. There are certain things that homeowners want. I live in a high rise. I don't need, I don't have a balcony. I don't need a lawnmower. I don't need a barbecue. I don't care how inexpensive barbecues are. I don't need one. I have no place to put it. Um, zip code, ethnic or religious backgrounds. I don't mean it in a mean way, but sometimes certain ethnic groups buy um, products that maybe the, the general population buys rarely. Think of, um, uh, peppers and adobo sauce. You know, an ethnic group might buy a lot more of that than the general population who maybe buys it once in a blue moon for a special recipe. Same way with religious um, things. You know, some people want to buy a cross, but other people want to buy a menorah. So, you know, you don't advertise them to the same group of people. Um, occupation, people who need special work boots are, you know, because of their occupation versus do they need a briefcase or a backpack to carry their laptop. Geographic location, we mentioned, I mentioned already about how train makes actually a different set of air conditioners for south of the Mason-Dixon line. Lifestyle issues, um, just where you are in your lifestyle. Are the kids still at home or are you empty nesters? Marital status, you know, sizes of products. When I first moved out of my parents' home, I bought the large ketchup and the large mayonnaise and the large this and the large that. I had never lived alone. And a girlfriend said, what the heck are you buying? She said, you just bought a lifetime supply of ketchup. I said, well, that's the size my mother always bought. She said, Donna, your mother had the whole household there. She said, it's you. Buy the small size of ketchup. And to this day, I buy a small size of ketchup and a small size of mayonnaise. Um, are there children in the household? Because there's products that you'll need that you might not buy if it was just adults. Same thing with hobbies. You know, you would buy yarn if you crochet or knit. You don't care how inexpensive yarn is if you don't <laughs> aren't able to use that. You know, it's no interest to you. And special interest, golfing, um, archery, special bird watching. You might buy very good um, binoculars where you wouldn't necessarily need them if you weren't a bird watcher. There's also common attributes if you want to do market segmentation for business to business. And sometimes it's the business type. Is it a private business? Is it a public business? Is it a government agency? Is it a nonprofit? And, and so even though you, you might make a consumer good, you might make pancake mix and think, well, I make a consumer product. But think again, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, they make a lot of pack pancakes for our troops. And so, yes, you might make a different size package if you're going to sell to the government or to the PXs on government land. But the government agency might actually be a customer, so don't overlook that. Industrial classification, is it a manufacturer, a retailer, or a wholesaler? You might need different cleaning products to clean up spills if you're a floor on a manufacturer versus a retailer or a wholesaler. Uh, you might use different cleaning products. Now, the number of employees, that's the way to um, do market segmentation because some, some big companies are very interested in check writing services, ADP or those types of companies. Uh, 
Paylocity, you know, people that prepare checks. If you only have three or four employees, you may not need it. Um, or if you're all, if it's all just family members, you may not need it. Annual sales volume. Companies that are bigger might need other goods and services that they don't need if it's a mom and pop shop. And also geographic location. Like I said, if you are a um, Home Depot in Chicago, you're going to carry snow blowers as well as uh, lawn mowers, and you're going to carry de-icer as well as uh, grass seed. So think about how to do segmentation. For uh, target specific markets or uh, marketing audiences, and you should define the primary target audience is the customer group that's the heaviest users. And if and when when a startup comes to me and they say, oh, everybody can use my product, I want to wrap their knuckles because it's you want to find the heaviest users. If I make mascara, the heaviest users are probably women 18 to 25. Now, the next group, 26 to 39, still wears a lot of makeup, but they might be my secondary market. And then my tertiary market might be women over 39 or over 50 because they're taking care of different um, occurrences that happen with older skin, you know, trying to get rid of wrinkles, try to get rid of age spots, things that you don't have when you're 18 or 19 years old, but you definitely have when you're 60 plus. Um, also, the tertiary market or audience might be a business audience, while your other target audience might be direct consumers. So that's why you have to think about who am I selling to? What common attributes do they share? And what common problem are they trying to solve? During the coronavirus, um, it can explain how retail stores were caught short of inventory on some items. When we talked before about the bags of flour, you couldn't find flour for weeks. You are just now starting to see five pound bags of all, uh, all purpose flour and bread flour on grocer shelves and whole wheat flour because they didn't sell that many to home chefs. Normally the home chef, maybe she'll buy or he'll buy flour at Christmas time. Even if you buy 10 pounds at Christmas because you're doing a lot of baking. Maybe you start at Thanksgiving and you buy five pounds at Thanksgiving and then another five in early December. But how much flour do you use in the dead of winter or not so much if you're the home baker? But everybody's making bread. My own husband started a sourdough uh, starter that took him weeks to get going. And then, he re and then he couldn't find flour. And so the manufacturers got caught because they didn't have the packaging for the five pound bags. And packaging, printing packaging, wasn't an essential service. Maybe it was for drugs, so they got special dispensation. But if you made a grocery product, it isn't. I'm hoping that's why um, frozen vegetables, they, that they're flying off the shelves so that they just can't keep up with the packaging. The same thing with toilet paper. Think about it. Most people are at school or work for many hours a day. And so they use commercial bathrooms when they're at school or work. And a commercial bathroom, they use those giant rolls of toilet paper. The manufacturers couldn't switch quickly enough to the consumer packaging because they didn't have it on their shelves because the printers weren't open and the amount of toilet paper that people were buying for the homes outstripped what they were used to producing. They just couldn't switch their manufacturing lines that fast. Now, why define a target audience? It's to make product decisions. It's to determine how to position the product or service. You know, is it good, better, best? Is it on par with the competition? To make pricing decisions. How much will the customer pay for it? To make advertising decisions. Some of those online schools that are from really accredited universities, they stress that A, they're accredited and how affordable they are and they're not raising their rent. Also, it's more cost effective to reach your heaviest users and make the biggest impact on sales by knowing who your heaviest users are. 
because your heaviest users might be reading certain magazines or listening to certain radio stations, or your heaviest users might go to the beauty parlor or the beauty supply store more, or they go to Ulta more frequently. And so you really want to attract the heaviest users. They're now also called brand influencers because of all the merchandising they will do for you on their own private YouTube channel. A few more words about buyer's behavior and targeting. Um, buyer's psychographic feelings frequently force the buyer to select a specific product. Urban dweller versus rural dweller. Or like I said, urban dweller versus home dweller. I don't need the barbecue. I don't need the lawnmower at any price. Income level or the income level they're working towards. You know, you might buy a more expensive suit because you're trying to emulate your boss at the law firm, or you're trying to emulate uh, that you're the most successful uh, real estate agent, even if you're starting out now. Education level, there's things that you might buy because you need a very expensive calculator if you're doing engineering calculations versus if you're adding up your checkbook. Um, importance of the family unit and children. If you don't have children in the house, there's a lot of things that you don't buy and you don't care what price they are. The same thing with the size of the family unit. You might buy family size products and the big jar of mayonnaise where I'm buying that tiny little jar of mayonnaise. And career status. Sometimes you feel about your career that you ought to look a certain way, carry a certain uh, purse, or have shoes that make you stand out in a crowd. Now, this is a competitive analysis. Uh, the Department of Business Affairs will be posting it so you can download it after our lecture. And um, it's, the way this works is you want to see how you rank against your competitors. And so you put your business name in the first spot in the left-hand corner, and then four or five of your biggest competitors. And then the factors that you think are most compelling for why a customer buys your good or service. So that's across the top in the factors. And then just to give you an idea, these are some competitive factors. They're not all the competitive factors, but some reason why the customers buy, buy for you. That it's a boutique versus something for everyone. That it's your hours of operation, you're open late. I mean, some dentists have late hours, some mom or orthodontist, some mom can get the kids there after school and she doesn't have to go on a Saturday or, or uh, give up a Saturday. Warranties, service after the sale, free or convenient parking. You'd be amazing how important parking is, especially with what city rates are sometimes. Uh, free or low cost delivery. That's a very, um, when Amazon came out with Prime, now almost all retail sellers will give you some free delivery or very low cost when you buy above a certain level. And they had to do it to compete with Amazon. Uh, customer service, focus on uh, the knowledgeability of salespeople. It is easier to buy from, you know, a computer, you wanna go and talk to somebody at Best Buy who sells computers all day long, or you wanna go to Micro Center because you think they're a little more knowledgeable. Price, price isn't the only decision to make a, a lot of purchasing decisions reliability payment terms. A lot of people buy from furniture companies because they have special payment methods, or they'll buy from a car company because it's 84 months now during the pandemic with 0% financing. How can you beat that? Uh, location and convenience. All of us will go to a convenience store and pay a little more for milk or bread because we don't wanna go into the big giant jewel. We don't wanna go into the giant Mariano's the wife said, pick up milk, and that's all you know, we're getting. Um, and we wanna be in and out in a heartbeat. Um, the management of the store, sometimes it's because you've just self developed a relationship with the store manager or even just your sales person. My sister's refrigerator went on the fritz over during the pandemic. And I went online, looked at Apt, 
and uh, found one called My Favorite Salesman, who's also sold to my sister, but she doesn't have access to the internet at the house. She's older sister. And I narrowed it down to two or three models. I said, which is the best one I should buy? He told me which one I should buy. I said, great, I'll have my sister call you in about 15 minutes and she'll order it. And she bought a refrigerator sight unseen because we trust this man. And he wasn't gonna give us bad advice. And APT is wonderful about making adjustments or taking stuff back if you're not happy. And that's ABT, so I, some of you may call it ABT. That's the one out in Glenview. They sell more um, appliances and home electronics than any big chain in America. And they only have that one location in Glenview, Illinois. I buy from them and I live downtown. Um, management, your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. Make sure you know what your greatest weakness is so you can change a negative to a positive. If your weakness is, oh, you're a small design firm, and somebody says, why should I buy from you? And say, because when you buy from me, you are dealing with the boss. When you buy from a major, you know, if you buy from American Eagle, you're gonna get somebody maybe fresh out of school who's gonna be your account manager. Nothing against American Eagle, they make wonderful websites, but you just have to understand what your greatest weakness is and why you should know why people buy from your business. Uh, common competitive factors can be ways to shop. If you can shop online, in-store, buy catalog, buy app, buy phone, um, or subscription service. I've done a lot of drive-by shopping lately where I order online and pick it up from the store and it's worked out surprisingly well during the pandemic. Free or low cost shipping, that's a big differentiator. And the return policy, how is it to return stuff? The younger you are, the more willing you are to buy anything online and not care about if you have to return it. A little older you are when you still remember shopping in stores, it's important that you can make an easy return. So yes, I order from stores, but I usually order from stores that have many retail locations. So I know if I don't like the product, I can just take it back uh, when stores open up. And don't forget to research the industry you're in. Is your industry growing? Is it stable or is it contracting? And it's important to know that because you still can make money and your business can still be profitable if you're in a special niche. And when you think of special niche, think of Alamo shoes. They specialize in hard to find sizes. They specialize in shoes for diabetics. So even though they have the one store Alamo, you know, and, and old fashioned shoe stores are certainly contracted a lot. There's not that many of them you know, know what you're up against in your industry. Who are the key players and how do you find the research? And the way to find the research is in the internet, trade publications, um, encyclopedia or uh, of trade publications. Those you get at the main library in downtown Chicago at Van Buren and State Street. They have an encyclopedia of trade associations. Research librarian, also great at the main library. Bureau of Labor Statistics to find how many people are in a specific industry. This is particularly good if you make a business to business product and the US Census. The US Census is great to use. It is a little challenging, but you can get it to work for you if you play around with it for a while. Um, simple low cost sales promotion. We talked about continuity of loyalty programs. We talked about uh, trinkets and trash and leave behinds, the magnets on the washer, indoor and outdoor signage coupons and direct mail. Uh, my personally, and I wrote a lot of copy in my life, create urgency. So always have, you know, a reason to come in that it's a special sale. It includes the expiration date when the coupon is or special offer is no longer get good. And I personally, just as a copywriter, don't like starting a coupon or an offer with a question because it's easy to say no to it and just go on to the next screen or the next uh, page in the magazine. Uh, simple, low, more low cost sales things, build a consumer mailing list or better yet an emailing list. Do uh, use constant contact or MailChimp. 
create a birthday discount or special offer, create volume discounts. And that's where the shipping price keeps going down the more you buy online or even in the store. And if they do it in stores too, where you spend $25, you say, Macy's does it, you save 20%, you spend $50, you save 25%, you spend $100, you save 30%, you know, something like that. A referral program where you get a bonus to, um, for referring a customer to buy from a company. Uh, it can be very important, especially if it's home services, uh, lawn care, uh, gutter care, roof repair, roo new roofing. Uh, have a wacky sales event, you know, bring in uh, canned goods for a food drive and get a coupon worth 20% off an item. Run a contest, even with a small prize, you'd be surprised how people are willing to give you an email address if you offer a $25 gift card even $15 sometimes. Social media, and elect e-newsletters, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, blogs, and search engine optimization, all important for your marketing efforts. Newsletters, they're easy, they're inexpensive, and you can customize coupons and offers in them. You know, don't send so many, but once, uh, a week, once every other week, and they have user-friendly analytics. When you use Constant Contact, you can tell how many people opened it, how many read a certain article. It's very easy to use. Facebook, you all know you have fan pages. They do them for to learn about new products and services and promotions from companies. And a huge user base, 2.6 billion active users, and that's from the first quarter of 2020. It's easy to use, and it's another way you can touch your clients and build brand awareness. It's all about the brand, so when they need a repeat buy, they only think of you. Uh, you have limited access to customize your page. You have to use their analytical tools to see who's following your message, and it's a closed environment, so only Facebook users uh, that become your fans or friends can see your messages. LinkedIn, it's free to use. It's used by professionals to connect with peers and potential clients for business or personal reasons. Profiles are straightforward and connections can be made easily. It allows for question and answer inquiries with a professional slant. These are more stodgy and they're less fun than Facebook, but it is a great way to fish to network for business contacts. So if you're looking for a business contact, you can see who in your network you know works at the same company. Then you, if you know the person, well, you can say, do you really know this guy at your company? And if he does, then, or she does, they can make a personal introduction. And it's much easier if you're selling business to business with a personal introduction. Um, job seekers use it the most. And people use these sites for purely professional reasons. So you can't do marketing messages. They are not welcome. Twitter, uh, it's all social networking. And it's an easy way to get followers. You choose a handle or a name and you communicate with tweets. They did increase it to 280 characters, including spaces and punctuation. But you want to use fewer than the 280 characters if you want to be retweeted. Um, Twitter is seen in real time and can have your business uh, give it greater exposure and uh, web search results because it's used in real time. It's easier to build a following of fans without having to reciprocate, and it's a very quick way to share links and contact. Your users can be vocal and they can retweet nice messages if they're happy with your business, but they can also spread some really unfavorable reviews quickly too. But it's great if you have a retail shop, a sandwich shop, and you want to tweet that there's a free beverage when you buy a sandwich or two sandwiches today or you get free fries with it. It is a great way for your following of your customers to build traffic. It's only text. Pictures and videos are shared through secondary links. You only get 280 characters and you want to really only use 240 if you want to be retweeted and people add something before they retweet your link. Um, there's lots of noise and clutter so messages are easy to ignore and spammers have a field day. YouTube, I'm in love with YouTube, especially now during the pandemic. 
because you really can learn how to do anything on YouTube, whether it's from the manufacturer or from lay people who are brand influencers. I learned how to sew a face mask. I hadn't sewed and used a machine in over 20 years, but I watched the video several times, got out the machine, got out the operating guide, and had to re remember where the heck the switch was for the electricity. So you can demonstrate videos how to use new or existing products, how to use a new food ingredient or a new food if you're importing something to America. Perfect to demonstrate do-it-yourself products using the company's products, how to make a perfect pie crust or what, what um, flowers to plant where in a garden, how to raise you know, your victory garden, how to sew a face mask, how to repair broken pavement. I have used YouTube for many repairs these last several weeks. Um, and also you find product influencers and they can promote your products or services on their YouTube channels. And they already have a huge following. Blogs, it's a web log. Uh, the more you publish, the more it helps your uh, search engine optimization because each post gives you more weight in a search engine. They post in chronological um, order. So it's easy to manage content. And like I said, it really helps with your search engine optimization. But blogs do have to be updated somewhat regularly to have any value to the reader. They take more time and effort than Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Templates are, are often free, but the service can be limited, so it may limit your communication. And you can use custom designs, but then you usually have to know a web language. Why use social media? Because it's free or very low cost, constant contact or mail chip. They're uh, popular with hundreds of thousands of users. And there is a big, huge user boost now in older demographics, rather, uh, 35 to 54, and even 55 and older. And I know that plenty of people 55 and older, now that they've been home for 10 weeks, have finally figured out social media. Um, and I'm in that group. I'm above 55, so I'm not poking fun at, at anybody out there. Um, they help build your brand awareness and extend your relationship with your customers. I told you now how Lumo Nadis is so successful with their social media that that's where they do all their job advertising. And it's easy for you to look out the competition and see what your competitors are doing and learn what they're up to. Websites, you need a, a website that is user-friendly even if it's just a billboard and it just talks about your hours and your services. It helps with search engine optimization, so if you know what words to put in the meta tags. And um, it's a, search engine marketing is a way of gaining traffic and visibility from search engines, both through paid and unpaid efforts. Um, we didn't talk about Google AdWords in this, Google AdWords is sort of pricey now. It depends on what you're in. But if you just Google uh, Google AdWords, it will come up. And basically, it's a bidding game, but you can set a limit on how much you want to spend every day. But when you're in the top position, you will be in the top search until you reach your spend every day. The other thing, it's called Google for Business now. It had a different name before. It's where you can put your company name, address, the hours you're open, your phone number, a link to Google Maps so they know how to get to your store. And that's free, so everybody should do one. Other tools, networking, elevator pitch. You never know who you're going to be selling to. Word of mouth, which is really a great way, especially if you're in the service business, to get customers. Because if I've had a good experience and told somebody who did my roof or repaired my gutters or is my landscaper and I'm happy with it, then it makes it very credible for the next neighbor to call you. Referral programs, public testimonials, a lot of those are used on websites, online review sites, Yelp, Angie's List, TripAdvisor, HomeAdvisor. So there's lots of other tools to get your name and credit customers. And when you've given good service, tell them to post favorably on TripAdvisor or Angie's List. And I just about finished in an hour. That's how to get hold of me. If there are any questions, you can uh, post them in the chat, and I will be happy to answer them. Or if you sent them to Elisa, uh, 
she can post them so I can see them. Hey, Donna, it's Elisa. Thank you so much for the presentation. I believe you covered a lot. Um, yeah, there was a lot. <laughs> um, but no, it's very helpful, I'm sure. The only question I currently see, and please, people, um, use the chat box to put your um, questions. One question that came through, is it really saving money if we sell through the internet? Is there a disadvantage? Well, it, it depends. If you sell directly from your own website, it can be very cost effective and you can charge for shipping and handling. So sometimes when you sell from, I'm not, I know they charge something. I don't know how much they charge when you sell through Amazon. When you have an Amazon store, they do take a cut and only you can decide how much of a cut you're willing to give up. Like, is it valuable for you to lose that amount of money to be seen by zillions and zillions of buyers who are in the market to buy. Because usually when you're doing a search on Amazon, you might not buy today, you may not buy tomorrow, but you're probably gonna buy in a week or 10 days because you're doing research because you think you need whatever it is you're looking for. So, but selling directly now, especially in this difficult time, like I said, I did a lot of uh, buying online where I bought online from the store, I paid with the credit card, and then I drove to the store and called from outside and said, hi, this is Donna. So then you have no shipping and you just need an employee to go out to the door and, you know, verify that I'm really Donna. So thank you. Yeah. Another question, are informal focus groups helpful? Yes, they can be, as long as you're not related to them. <laughs> so if, they're, you know, not your friends and family, not your next door neighbors, but if they are strangers, and sometimes you can get strangers, like say you have a product that you think is very important to uh, college students, 18 to 24 year olds, and you have a college student, you can tell them to put together a group that you'll give everybody a $10 gift card at Target for, you know, for being part of the focus group, but they can't be his friends. He has to advertise and, to, you know, be, and you, you pay your son or child something. So if you're not directly related to them yet, like if they're just customers, you know, if you already have a store and you can put out the call to customers, but it's better if you use total strangers. Great. How do you come up with a budget to market your service? I, that's a very important question. Uh, question and a lot of people do it as just so they don't overspend they do it as a percent of sales so if you have a restaurant and it's a little sandwich shop and your average ticket price is nine dollars you know you might want to say you know 10 percent of that or 25 percent of that you know is worth advertising but you know how much you can afford so if it's 10 or 12 percent fine and then, you know, so if the monthly sales are $5,000 a month and you can afford 10%, then spend $500 on advertising. That way you don't overspend. And, and don't spend, you know, you can spend it in one place one month and another place another month to see if you get more bang for your bet. Because sometimes when it's local, just paying for that bench, near the bench near the bus stop, can be a good investment. What is the cost slash benefit to utilizing third parties such as Grubhub? You know, I understand that they are very expensive to use. Um, and so we've sort of shied away from it. And during these pandemic times, we have ordered through the company's direct website and then picked it up and then they don't have to pay Grubhub. So if they're gonna, you know, you can try it. If they're, you don't have to sign a long contract. You can sign, you know, if you can get 30 days, try it, see if you like it. It might be worth it to see if it's that useful to you. And there's competitors now, DoorDash and other ones, you know, and Uber Eats. So you can see if it's really worth it to you. But otherwise, 
you know, advertising that if they order directly from you online, even if it's on your website when they're checking out the menu, that you give them a, a you know, a free liter of, of soda pop, that might be worth it. Next question is more industry specific. How would I advertise a small painting company? Do you paint um, houses or commercial painting? This person did not specify. Okay, so if you have a small painting company and you really do do homeowners, it might pay for you to, like I said, advertise on a bench in the neighborhoods that you, you know, near where you live, where you like to do paint so you don't have a huge commute, or a website, or getting reviews on Angie's List and Home Advisor. And you can't pay for those reviews. They have to be posted because the company thought you, because that's where a lot of people look when they go to hire a painter. And those are free, so the best thing you can do is when you always ask for a review to be posted on Home Advisor or Angie's List. And then when they post something nice, you know, you can reward them for because some people say they do it, but they don't do it. And so you can give them, send them a $10 Starbucks or Target gift card. Next question. How do I utilize, uh, how do I utilize podcasts to promote your service or product? So, um, you know, that is a good question that I don't know, because I have not done it that much, you know, really. And so I would say if you have a following, though, you can promote it on your social media, that this is when you're giving a cast and the, a podcast in real time, and they can also hear it at a later date just by clicking on the link. So if you have other social media, your newsletter or your uh, regular, you know, uh, Facebook page or something, that is a way you can popularize it. Or if you have an emailing list, you know, that you're going to give a podcast on, if you're a, uh independent garden store like Pat, you know, how to buy plants for your backyard, that is a way you can do it pretty cost effectively. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. I might have missed this topic about marketing. Is it conducive to just single out one way of marketing, such as social media, if I can't afford 10% on advertising? Yes, if you can if you can afford Zippo, nada, nothing, by all means, something is better than nothing. But another way that you can get something for very long, if you have really a storefront, is see if you can't pr cross promote with other merchants in the area. So you don't want to compete with somebody in your, like if you have the sandwich shop, but the dry cleaner, maybe she'll let you put a flyer with a coupon in the dry cleaners and you advertise the dry cleaner in your storefront. So then it's just a few pennies for printed paper. So that is, a, you know, so social media tweeting, saying that you, you know, ask for um, the, people who come into your stores now that stores are mercifully over, even if they just pick up, you know, ask for a business card or have them fill out a coupon if they give you an email address. And that is a great way to advertise for free or very little using. Because um, I think Constant Contact lets you have 50 readers for free. So your first 50 are free and you can see if then you get them to buy more. So if you don't have time, you know, don't overspend. But think about it even before you open up. How do you get feet into the shop or to your website to buy? Because a lot of people regrettably open up first and then worry about foot traffic later. And you also, this is very important. If you see a restaurant that's gone out of business 12 times, I don't care what the rent is. Really think about before you rent that joint. Yes, you don't have to build out the kitchen. It's already built out. But maybe there's a reason why it never succeeds. And it might be that it's just not in a place where you can't park or you can't, you know. So, you know, opening up a store of the same format in one that failed is sometimes screaming, don't open it up there. Okay. Um, if anyone else has questions, please utilize the chat box. 
Um, we do have a couple more, but if anyone ha has more questions, please use the chat box to ask. I see one questions. that's about posting prices or services on websites. Okay. If they don't want to leave the door open, um, you know, if you want to have pricing flexibility, you can just say, you know, uh, we do repairs and say you don't want to quote, you know, have a thing because you don't know if the wash machine, do they need a gasket or do they need a screw or do they need something? You know, just say, um, you can say, call for an appointment. We charge X amount of dollars for the estimate, but it's deducted if you buy the service or you only pay $10 for the uh, estimate if you do the service. You know, make it really um, effective to then have them buy from you. But sometimes you don't want to post the price because you really don't know what it is. And when you see it, even when you order home remodeling, they tell you in the fine print that if they find something that they weren't expecting in your walls, when they open up your walls, they reserve the right to requote the job. So uh, okay. I hope we answered everything. Uh, circling back real quick to the focus groups, any advice on how to actually conduct focus groups? There's probably a YouTube video, not that I've watched it, but yes, have open-ended questions. First of all, they should be in your target audience so, or what you believe to be your target audience. So if you have a new um, hair cream for teens that adds instant color and then it's washed out in the next wash, you know, you can be purple or pink or God knows what color they want. Um, then, you know, so, so target who you, invite who you think is your target audience. You might find out in the first thing that it's not your target audience, but that's still important information. And then when they do come in, you know, you have treats and whatever, and they introduce themselves and say a little bit about where they work or where they go to school. And then just to break the ice to get them talking to each other, ask open-ended questions. You don't want questions yes or no, unless it's like, do you like package A more than package B? But otherwise you want to say, how often do you wash your hair? How, you know, have you ever used pink dye in your hair? What current pink dye have you used? You know, what did you like about that brand of pink dye? Not just yes or no questions. Great. So we do have several industry specific um, requests about advertising and marketing, one of them being for uh, a financial service such as this bookkeeping or a financial advisor, another being a micro project management based consulting firm. So talking about those two, but also where people or what are some good resources on where to advertise and market for an industry. Okay. So Sometimes it's joining the Chamber of Commerce because, and I really love good Chamber of Commerce. Not all are as good as others, some are better than others, but most chambers will let you go to one or two of the meetings without becoming a member. So if the pancake breakfast is $25 for non-members and $15 for members, pay the extra 10 bucks and go and see if it's people who can use your service. This is particularly for the financial planners, you know, that's a great way to meet other owners who maybe need to plan for their retirement and they're not because they're small business owners and you could show them how to set up a, a step or some other um, retirement plan, you know, for their investments. And what was the other company? It was a micro what? A micro project management based consulting firm. Wow. Well, I, I, I don't know. It depends on if you've, if you've had customers where you've actually done work for, you can ask those customers for a referral. Like if I organized your stock system in your store and it's made you much more efficient, can you recommend, you know, other, because uh, they might have brothers or brother-in-laws or sisters or sister-in-laws or neighbors who are, uh, you know, small business people know other small business people, so they might be able to give you a personal introduction, which makes it the easiest way to sell, because somebody's used you and liked you, and so they've uh, made it easy. 
Okay, so somebody just posted out, what questions can you ask yourself when you're marketing or considering marketing during these crisis times? Lord, yes. Um, so what, like I said, one of those things you can do is as stores begin to reopen is to cross promote with your other shopkeepers because it's a way to say that you're open, you're ready for business, you're, you know, and it's, and they're already in the other store. Like I said, as long as it's a non-competing store, another type of shop, you know, if you're um, a hair salon and you're advertising at the dry cleaners or the coffee shop, they're not going to do your hair at the coffee shop. So that can be a great way to spread the words and, and always have that monthly drawing for whatever kind of giveaway because then it builds your emailing list and that's the way where you can tell customers to get a special offer. And, you know, in typical times, I, I like also those um, value pack ads, Advo or value pack, where you're one coupon in a bunch of others. But during this pandemic, that wasn't really viable because so many stores were closed. But in window signage too, yes, we're open, we're all set, you know, we're ready for phase three, we've practiced whatever, come on in and have, you know, giving away a mask. You give away a mask these days, <laughs> I think they will beat a path to your doorway. If you give away a mask, write me at dxrockin at gmail.com. All right. That's all the questions I see um, on my end. Let's see. I obviously have a lot of comments of thank you, Donna. The great yes, it was very sweet of everyone. <laughs> So I definitely want to say the same thing. Thank you so much, Donna. This is very helpful. It's I don't pleasure. have any other questions coming through. If anyone has a last minute question, please shoot it this way. If you did miss part of this presentation or just want to go back and review some of the information, we will be posting this webinar on our YouTube page. If you just go to youtube.com in the search bar, type in Chicago B. EP, that's all one word, and probably in the next couple of days it will be posted up there. Thank you, Lisa. That's very kind. Absolutely. Um, those are my own closing remarks. Donna, if you have any additional things you want to mention? No, I, I, the only thing is, is when the libraries do open up, mm -hmm. know the research librarian because they can really help you research things about competitors in your area. Trade people, I will I'll name two books that I love if you sell business to business. And do not buy these books, they are expensive. Go to the library, the main library has them. And one is the Manufacturers, Illinois Manufacturers Association. So the Illinois Manufacturers Association. The other one is the Illinois like Service Providers Association. So one lists every manufacturer in Illinois and one lists all the service providers. So if you make a, something that you can use, sell to a manufacturer, it'll tell you like usually who the head of sales is, who's the head of manufacturing, how many employees they have, what size sales they have. Because you might say, oh, well, I know I do really well selling my hairnets to companies that have um, sales of, you know, uh, $400,000 a year or $5 million a year. And so it can help you qualify customers. I also like using this because when I sold, when I had just the advertising firm, when I sold the customer in a certain zip code and I did a lot of business to business advertising, I looked for other customers in that zip code because I knew I could tell them I'm down in your neighborhood, you know, three times a week because I do work for Mushusta or I do work for, you know, so-and-so company, and they're just down the street from you. And it was a good way to get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. So I do like the Illinois Manufacturers Association and the Illinois uh, Service Providers Association directories. These are directories. And um, it's very good. Another thing is the PLMA is headquartered, uh, I think it's in New York, but their show is always in Chicago. God knows they're not probably going to have one. But it's um, all private label food manufacturers. So if you sell something to the food industry, don't look over the private labelers. Somebody said, what about cold calling? 
Cold calling is extremely hard these days because of voicemail and screening and, you know, they don't answer and, and uh, you can see everybody's number that shows up that you don't know who it is that so you don't answer the phone. So cold calling is very hard. What is better is to write a letter of introduction and then say, I'm going to call you in a few days and try to arrange a mutually convenient, you know, Zoom meeting or whatever you want to do. And then when you call back, call early in the morning or right after five o'clock, because that's when they're not looking at that screen who's calling them. It's because they think it's their spouse telling them, stop at the grocery store, pick up a dozen eggs, pick up a thing of milk. And so sometimes they answer the phone because their guard is down because they're not expecting salespeople to call at 515. So that is my personal advice. But otherwise, you can try cold calling and you have to do it. Till it. The other thing is, too, is if you call somebody and they're not the right person. So I call um, Commissioner es Escarena and she says, oh, I don't handle that. Joe Blow on my team handles that. It is good to call Joe Blow and say, Rosa Escarena told me to call you. Then they might call you back. I mean, she did tell you to call him, so it's not a lie. But... We do have another question that came through. Um, is it bad slash unprofessional practice to use a Gmail or other anonymous email addresses? Aren't we supposed to create an email on our own domain? You can. You can. I don't because I never quite finished. You know, I'm semi-retired these days. So I never quite finished the Rocket Enterprises email. I mean, I do have, I, I don't really use it. If you want to get my attention, write me at Gmail. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then um, but, during your presentation, but, you did mention a competitive analysis. Um, and there is a handout for this webinar that we will be emailing out to participants. So yes. um, check your inbox as soon. Um, if not today, definitely by noon tomorrow, we will have it to everyone who attended the webinar. Thank you. And also, if you, if you are a, a professional service provider like I am, if you use a Gmail account, it's not the worst thing in the world. Because, you know, if you're an accountant or a lawyer, and you're a private shop and, you know, that's what you use. You might not, my own attorney uses just a Gmail account. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the professions, it's not as strange as if you're a, a uh, retail shop. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, Alrighty, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you again, Donna. This was super helpful. Um, once again, we will have this up on our YouTube page. Um, we host our webinars twice a week, so please tune in for other ones. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. And, of course, Donna, thank you the most for sharing your expertise with us. My pleasure. Thank you again. Call me anytime. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.